Now, for us, the common things that we do that we have to be particularly aware of, of wearing our PPE is during the oral peripheral examination, when you're first beginning your assessment with the patient, uh, certainly during feeding, uh, a lot of times feeding is the first part of what speech does with our swallowing patients, um, and during the swallowing examination, whether this is at the bedside um, or downstairs uh, in your radiology suite doing your modified barium swallows, um, it is a place that kind of, I think, I think at the bedside, we're really aware of the equipment because it's all around us. Uh, but when we're feeding patients, uh, we should remember that we also need to be gloved and gowned and masked if it's necessary with that patient. Um, if the patient comes down from, from acute care and you're not real familiar with the patient, they, whoever brings them down, should tell you what precautions they're on. So if they're on C diff precautions, that means not only will you wear gloves, but you'll be wearing a mask and a gown, etc. cetera. Um, so kind of, be aware of that in the back of your mind, particularly those of you who do lots of swallow studies. Uh, let's talk a quick moment here about manipulative or manipulatives. This is a very important thing for speech pathologists um, who work with adults and children uh, using objects and pictures, uh, but also particularly for audiologists um, who use lots of equipment that is shared from patient to patient, client to client. Uh, I do want to remind you that uh, children are particularly uh, vectors of infection. Um, they're dirty little guys. They um, often aren't very good about things like oral care and hand care. So their, their mucus and their mouths are infected and so are their hands. Um, and they are more typical uh, able to harbor and shed both respiratory and gastrointestinal viruses, even when they're asymptomatic. Uh, daycare centers are a particular problem uh, everywhere now uh, particularly because children come home from daycare and carry the infections back into the household uh, where the parent picks up the disease um, or uh, siblings pick up the disease uh, that are simply coming from some toy that was played with earlier in the day, maybe mouthed by a baby, then pass it over to another baby, um, and then touched by either the caregivers um, or other children who then bring it back. Some of you may know about cytomegalovirus or CMV. We now think one of the main courses of CMV uh, is when a child carries home the cytomegalovirus from the healthcare setting, um, and then it's passed on um, to the mother who may be um, pregnant or beginning to be pregnant, and uh, she can, uh, you know, they often pick it up just from a kiss or wiping a child's nose um, or touching utensils, uh, eating off the child's plate, etc. And as a matter of fact, those people who are uh, working on CMV prevention, um, I think very shortly will now begin to teach all uh, Americans, as particularly young mothers who are planning to be pregnant or are pregnant, um, about the dangers of picking up CMV from their other children. I'm going to show you several chains of infection now and how we break those chains. Um, you don't have to know all of these or read all of these. I, I put them on there just for a reference for you. If later on you're looking back over this lecture. Uh, but standard precaution breaks the chain of infection, thus minimizing any transmission of infection within the uh, environment in which you work, the healthcare environment or the schools, for instance. Um, there is always an infectious agent. There is a reservoir. There is a portal for it to exit, um, a means of transmission, then a portal for it to enter the uh, host, and then uh, the susceptible host then picks up the disease. Uh, you're going to see here in the next couple of slides, for instance, if we look at standard precautions like hand washing, which is the most effective. You'll see that most of the links are broken here uh, because we uh, break down the infectious agent from the reservoir. Uh, we keep our hands clean. Uh, we eliminate the portal of exit uh, from the reservoir to the portal of exit. We don't, we wear gloves so we can't transmit things. Uh, and we keep those gloves on and keep our protective equipment on so that we have a means to block transmission. Uh, and keep the patient from becoming uh, infected um, either through airborne uh, precautions or from uh, body fluid touching um, or through bloodborne uh, infections. Uh, the next one there you'll see is the use of protective personal uh, equipment or PPE. Uh, again, you see that what we happens there is we're breaking the portal of exit uh, because we, the, the infection can't get to us and it can't get to them. That stops the transmission, um, and therefore it blocks it from uh, spreading to other uh, patients. And then more importantly, I think, and one of the most important things that I had to learn as I was working on this, 
was that we're always in the process of also protecting ourselves so that we don't act as a vector of infection or one of the reasons that an infection is spread. Now, what that means is, for instance, you get your annual flu immunization. Matter of fact, ours are starting this week at my hospital. But you should also update your MMR, measles, mumps, and rubella. And you should also update your DPT. Now, these are things that you can uh, speak to your own provider about and see what he recommends, what kind of schedule he'd like to have you on for those. Uh, hepatitis B vaccine has been available since the late early 80s, early 90s. Um, hopefully you've already been through it. It's a double series uh, vaccination. You take one shot and then one several months later. Um, and uh, if you haven't done that and you're working around people that are uh, prone to that kind of uh, illness or um, you're working with a group of people who are immunosuppressed, for instance, uh, you should be protecting yourself against Hep B 